Now, uh, let's just push out a bit more on the implications of, um, of, the, of these two journeys in terms of the way the communities of faith are put together. I'm looking at topic 12, and um, the theme is Medina and Jerusalem, and the uh, chapter that you would read in, uh, in uh, Ways is uh, chapter 9, and in the dialogue, it would be chapter 12, chapter 12, just chapter 12 in the dialogue. <clears throat> now, in, in, um, in Medina, Muhammad became both prophet and statesman. In fact, there's a book written about that by a scholar called Montgomery Watt called Muhammad, Prophet and Statesman. It's in Medina that he brings those two together. And it was the hijra that made that possible. The hijra, as we said, is the migration of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. This happened in the year 622. The Muslim era begins with the Hijra. That's amazing. It does not begin in 570 when Muhammad was born. It does not begin in 610 when Muslims claim that the revelations from Gabriel began at Mount Hira. It begins with the Hijra. That's the beginning of the Muslim era. Well, why would that be so important? What do you think? The power. That's exactly right. I ask, I ask my Muslim friends that quite frequently, and this is the answer I always get. For the first time in history, a prophet of God brought together prophetic ministry and political power and put in place a political religious system that potentially could extend to the whole world. Moses tried, but he only succeeded in putting a system in place which applied to Israel. It never extended to the whole world, you see. Jesus didn't even try. Didn't even try. In one of these dialogues we've been having with Muslim theologians, um, one of the theologians says, you know, the problem with Jesus was he didn't have enough time. He only had three years of public ministry, and then, then he was gone. So he didn't have enough time. If he would have had, you know, 20-some years like Muhammad did, he would have brought about a political kingdom on earth, just as, just as Muhammad did, but his time was cut short. But he says, thanks be to God, this Muslim theologian told us, Constantine brought together what Jesus failed to bring together. Because in Constantine, the political order and the religious order, the church and the state were united. So Constantine did it, although Jesus failed to do it. And you scratch your heads, we think Constantine was a distortion of what the gospel is about. <laughs> he thought that this, is, this makes sense, you see. But you see, Muhammad brought it, brought it together for the first time ever, where the political authority and the religious authority converged together and put it together in such a way that it can extend to all the world. Nothing this significant has ever happened in history. That's why the Hijra is so extremely significant, theologically, politically, practically speaking. And so the Muslim movement, the Muslim era, begins with the Hijra. And so like I mentioned earlier, in Medina now, Muhammad is able to put together a political religious order which, and a constitution is adopted, which is able to extend to the whole world, potentially. And by the time of his death, it had, indeed, it had indeed extended to all of Saudi Arabia. This political religious order is referred to as the Dar al Salam. The region of Islamic peace, Dar al Salam. Now, not all the world is under Islamic peace. So what are, the re what are the regions called which are not part of the Dar al-Salam? Those outside the rule of Islam. Well, one area of that region outside of the rule of Islam, I said Dar al-Salam, I'm sorry, uh, also often referred to as Dar al-Islam. Remember, we said Islam means peace. Salam means peace as well. Um, they will say Dar al-Salam. 
Islam, which means Salam. So this Dara Islam, which is the region under Muslim political power, what about the regions outside of Muslim political power? Well, they are often referred to as the Dar al Haram, meaning the regions of war and confusion that are outside of Muslim political control. And so, then you have other regions which are not Dar al Haram, they're not confusion necessarily, they're not under Muslim political control necessarily but they're at peace with the Muslims. And those regions are referred to as the Dar al-Ahad, the region of the treaty, the region of the covenant, the region which is at peace with the Muslims, although they are not Muslim. So the world is basically configured within the Medina model of looking at things as three different regions. The region Dar al-Islam, which is under Islamic political control, and then the Dar al-Hadab, which are the regions at war, like the Meccans were, with the Muslim community, conflict between the two, and the Dar al-Ahad, which is the region of the covenant, which are people that are not Muslim, but they're peace with the Muslims. I think for many years, the United States was considered by the Dar al-Islam as Dar al-Ahad a region of peace, which is at peace with the Muslims, and, uh, and um, um, not at war with that region, we're at peace with it. I, with the wars going on now, I think that's becoming more and more of a question. But Obama in his speech in Cairo tried to cultivate that, that understanding. I think he's working hard at that. But, um, but it's, it's, it's those three different regions. Now, um, um, Within the Dar al-Islam, <laughs> as it relates to the regions outside, which are in conflict with Islam, conflict takes place sometimes. And that happened with Muhammad. You know, for eight years, there was wars between the Meccans and the Muslims, conflict on the edges. And it's in the context of that conflict that a number of these sword verses in the Quran um, are, um, are proclaimed. Um, for example, in Surah 2, Surah 2, uh, verse uh, 190, fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you, but do not transgress limits, for Allah does not love transgressors. Notice that, fight, but be careful also not to go beyond bounds and slay them wherever you catch them, and turn them out from where they have turned you out. For tumult and oppression are worse than slaughter. But do not fight them at the sacred mosque unless they first fight you there. But if they fight you, slay them. Such is the reward for those who oppress faith. That if you are turned out of your regions, out of the land that you have possessed, then you need to fight. But if they cease, Allah is all forgiving, most merciful, and fight them on until there is no more tumult or oppression, and there prevail justice and faith in Allah. But if they cease, let there be no hostility except to those who practice oppression. You see, that, that, that ambivalence. You need to fight those that oppose you, those who have occupied your land, those who are seeking to destroy the Muslim movement. You must fight them. But then do it, do it without, without going beyond bounds. Um, and, and be ready to forgive when they cease from the hostilities or ready to, to talk with you. And there's a number of, uh, of passages like that in the Quran. And it's these passages, these sword passages, which uh, the jihadist stream, the modern jihadist stream, uh, I should say, the violent jihadist stream within modern Islam, which is a minority stream, but it's there. But they draw much of their um, um, sustenance from these sword passages in the Quran very important that we hear how Muslims exegete these passages. And one of the struggles that the modern Muslim movement works with is how you exegete and interpret the Quran, the hermeneutic of the Quran. Uh, there is these doctrines in the Quran, this doctrine in the Quran, about some surahs abrogating other surahs. So um, these sword passages <laughs> 
are passages revealed in Medina, not in Mecca. These are Medina passages, the sword passages. And so some would say, well, since they came later, the later revelations supersede the earlier revelations. So the Medina revelations would supersede the Meccan revelations. Tracking? So the sword passages would trump the more peaceful passages which come through in, Me in Mecca. That's one stream of interpretation. But others say, no, 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 no. No, we need to look at context. And in many parts of our world, the Meccan context is really more appropriate to who we are. Take India, for example. There's, what, 300 million in uh, Muslims living in India, you know, in peace, in a pluralistic society, generally speaking. And so the Meccan experience, where they don't have political power in India, but they're minorities within a larger nation, the Meccan experience is more appropriate to who we are as Muslims in India. So it would be the Meccan passages that would be most helpful to us in understanding how we should live within, within, the, um, within our modern pluralistic world. And that, brothers and sisters, is a major debate and discussion going on among Muslims. And then others would say, actually, chronology has nothing to do with it at all. It is this, this um, um, Umm al-Kitab we talked about yesterday, in which there is at the heart of the Umm al-Kitab, the mother of the book, uh, passages which are especially, um, um, especially define what Islam is all about. And so the whole Quran is informed by those that soul, that soul within, within the Quran, uh, which define the essence of Islam and all the rest of the Quran is simply amplification of that soul. And so those are skills that the Muslim ulama bring into the interpretation of Islam and related to, very much related to, the struggle between the um, pre-Hijra Muhammad and the revelations that come there and the after-Hijra Muhammad and the revelations that come there and how you apply them in, in the modern world, because the face of those revelations uh, is, is um, in dynamic interaction. <laughs> and uh, I'm very grateful that occasionally we as Christians are invited into those conversations at certain levels, certainly not at the deeper levels where the theological directions are set, but uh, we are invited into, into those conversations occasionally and deeply grateful for the way some of us have been invited into conversations in Iran in regards, to, um, in regards to these sorts of themes, as was the case in that presentation I made to that gathering of probably 1,500 Muslim theologians in Iran. Deeply uh, humbled and grateful for that kind of invitation and feeling there is really a quest to try to listen to what, what the church has to say about, about these kinds of, of concerns. I went through that rather rapidly but these issues of the Meccan face and the, and the Medina face of, um, of the Islamic movement, uh, of the Muslim movement, the Ummah, the movements of the Ummah, are, uh, are very pertinent to how Muslims work at interpretation questions in regards to the Quran. And I think it behooves us to realize that there, is, um, there are special skills and insights and theological uh, commitments that Muslims bring to the interpretation of the Quran. And as outsiders, we need to uh, watch that conversation, uh, but be aware that uh, we cannot enter into it with the depth that the Muslims do. Um. Yes. Ask, which position, as they talk about difference between Mecca's uh, chapters and Medina's chapter, which position is winning now among the Muslim Ummah? Oh, I think it's a very dynamic dialogue. A very dynamic dialogue. I was in Afghanistan uh, a couple years ago, and in the newspapers uh, there was uh, headline news about this very issue, that some theologians were saying the Meccan model is most appropriate to a modern pluralistic world, and as Afghanistan develops its constitution, we should keep that in mind. And others were saying the Medina model is really what we need in Mecca, in, in, in Afghanistan that it was not just a debate among the theologians, it had become a very vigorous discussion within the press. So it's, uh, it's global and it's specific. I was in a mosque in central United States a couple years ago, for my wife and I, for a weekend of dialogue. The Mennonite congregation and the Muslim congregation were having uh, a weekend of dialogues. And they were saying, uh, we embrace the Mecca model here in this congregation. 
We're a university town. Many of our imams and, and worshipers in this mosque are university professors and so forth. We think uh, a pluralistic world is good. And we hope to be faithful Muslims within a pluralistic world. But we believe whenever, whenever a community, including the Muslim community, gets political power, it gets corrupted, always. Muhammad didn't get corrupted because he was a prophet of God, they say. But you look at our history as Muslims, corruption has happened over and over again when we get political power, is what they were saying to us. So we, uh, we don't want political power. Oh, one of us might run for a position on the town council, something like that. But we don't want a Dar al-Islam uh, arrangement here in Urbana, uh, Illinois, is, which is where the, where the mosque was. So, and remember that, that uh, hundreds of millions of Muslims are now in diaspora all over the world. And these Muslims, like these in Urbana, are very influential uh, and are speaking into the worldwide Muslim movement as they try to discern the way. Very good question. 